Welcome to the Oasis. My name's Mike, and this is the State of VR for May 2020. Firstly, I want to say thank you for all the positive comments on my first State of VR video last month. I really, really appreciate it. It's always a bit daunting trying something new on the channel, so thank you for all the feedback and support. The VR community is truly, truly awesome. A quick update on some things I talked about on the previous State of VR video. Since I talked about my speculation on Oculus Del Mar, we've had an article from Bloomberg providing some supposedly leaked information about the next Oculus Quest. I made a whole video about the details here if you want to go check it out. Also, HP officially unveiled the HP Reverb G2, and it's a really interesting new PC VR headset, which I also did a video on covering all the features up here. For me personally, this month has been another month of lockdown here in the UK, although it seems like plans to ease it are coming soon, so there's some light at the end of the tunnel to finally catch up with friends and family. I hope you're all keeping safe and well wherever you are in the world right now. The VR games keeping me busy over the past few weeks have been Half-Life Alex and Phantom Kova Ops on PC VR, Iron Man on PSVR, and Tetris Effect on Oculus Quest. Let me know what you've been playing this month in the comments down below. This month, we also had a few articles from mainstream media about how this lockdown should have been VR's big moment, but seem to completely disregard the fact that demand has outpaced the supply for the last six months and that the most popular headsets are still almost impossible to get hold of, with just a few pockets of stock arriving in limited supply and then being quickly snapped up. The scalpers on eBay are out in full force, with headsets being sold up to £800 here in the UK. Please, please don't spend that much money on a headset and be patient if you can. More stock will be coming soon. We even had Forbes who internally couldn't agree whether VR was dead or not, with completely polarizing articles written just a day apart. But as you'll see in this video, I have some healthy stats to show you that VR's had one of the best years to date, and it's only gonna get better from here. So let's kick this off with the Oculus Rift S and Quest, as they both celebrated their one year anniversary this month. The Quest has had a phenomenal year with a steady release of games and regular and innovative updates, including Oculus Link, a redesigned user interface, updates to the Guardian system, and full hand tracking support without the need of any additional hardware, which is just amazing. It's clear that hand tracking is an important feature for Oculus moving forward, as VP of AR and VR at Facebook, Andrew Bosworth, gave us a glimpse of the future when he posted a video clip of pass-through mode and hand tracking being used together for productivity on a new prototype headset. Although gaming and social applications are important for VR success, productivity could take it from being niche to mainstream, especially if you remove the need of controllers by using hand tracking. Think of it like the shift from traditional mobile phones to smartphones. Using your hands to interact with the device by simply swiping and tapping opened up the tech to a whole new audience and made it accessible to everyone. Using a headset to replace your workspace and having multiple virtual monitors minority report style that could be accessed anywhere in the world with just a headset using hand tracking is a total game changer that could truly change the way we work forever. We're a little way off that right now, of course, but it's interesting to get a glimpse of what they're aiming for in the future. Now, although the Oculus Quest had a great year, the Rift S seems to have been left in the dark somewhat, with most new games being ports from Oculus Quest, and sadly, no updates for hand tracking or the new Guardian system. Now, I wonder if this is a limitation of the hardware on the Oculus Rift S, or Oculus just don't see the value in adding these features to the platform. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. The Rift S is still a great headset, by the way, and one that I continue to use regularly myself, but the lack of support from Oculus is making it a difficult headset to recommend nowadays, especially when compared to the Quest, as you don't want to recommend a platform that appears to have been completely abandoned. But when you take into account these figures I'm about to share with you, you'll probably start to understand why Oculus are pushing forward with the Quest, and maybe not so much with the Rift S, as it's clear that this is what consumers want, a standalone headset without the requirement of a PC. During the anniversary, Oculus announced that they've sold over 100 million US dollars worth of content on just the Oculus Quest platform alone in its first year, with 10 apps raising $2 million in revenue each. 
Now, sadly, they didn't give us any information about how the Rift S performed in the same time period, which in itself is telling. SideQuest, a third-party application for sideloading experimental games and content on Quest, also reached an important milestone this month with over 1 million downloads of their app. With these figures, it's difficult to estimate the amount of quests sold to date, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was somewhere in the region of 1 to 2 million units. With Oculus Connect 7 just being a few months away now, hopefully we'll get some official details on the number of headsets sold, and we'll get to find out what Oculus have planned next, which many believe will be a hybrid headset, a standalone device with the capability of being connected to a PC for PC VR content. Essentially, a next generation quest but only time will tell. And now onto a section which I want to be an ongoing feature of the series, and that is VR Clip of the Month. Check out this video from Reddit user Zachary Sly, whose wife wanted to explore what VR chat had to offer, but struggled to get any further when it came to choosing an avatar. It's such a wholesome clip and it makes me smile every time I see it. If you find any funny clips that you think should be featured on the series in the future, please feel free to email me or tag me on social media. Next up is something that I'd been really looking forward to and that's the Half-Life Alex Steam Workshop being officially released. This month, Valve opened up the official workshop, which will now open up the floodgates for level designers and modders alike to create their own stories and content for Half-Life Alex. This is really important for this game moving forward, as the original Half-Life spawned mods which later became full games in themselves, such as Counter-Strike, Gary's Mod, and Team Fortress. I'd highly recommend checking out mods Crash Course and Mindbreak, both of which are short single-player experiences created by Sadly It's Bradley. And also check out Jedi Alex, which is a lightsaber training map, which is a lot of fun to play around with. Alongside these mods, B Haptics, who make haptic feedback equipment for virtual reality, added support for Half-Life Alex to their range of haptic vests, arm sleeves, and facial interface kits. Feeling a wave of feedback flowing over my body whilst recharging my health at a health station felt incredible. And also, feeling a head crab jump at my face was as terrifying as it sounds. You can check out my full gameplay of Crash Course using the haptic feedback kit from B Haptics here if you're interested. Mods aside, we also had an official update from Matthew Wilde at Valve with an impressive water physics update, which added liquid to all the bottles in the game. You can even shake the bottles to see the bubbles inside rise to the surface. It's great to see that the game is continuing to evolve after release, and I'm sure these updates and mods are just the beginning of what we can expect. I can't wait to see more mods in the future, particularly ones including my mate Jeff and multiplayer. That would be totally amazing. Let me know what you want to see in Half-Life Alex in the future in the comments down below. Next, I want to talk about PlayStation as things are starting to heat up with the upcoming release of Sony's next generation console, the PS5. The PlayStation VR still serves as one of the biggest VR platforms to date with over 5 million units sold. This is due to the enormous user base with over 1 million PS4 consoles sold and the amazing PlayStation VR exclusive titles such as Iron Man, Astro Bot, Blood and Truth, Firewall Zero Hour and Resident Evil 7 to name just a few. With that said though, the current PSVR is really starting to show its age now with the old light tracking system and move controllers. It could really do with an upgrade and it seems like Sony have been working on just that in the background. This month, Upload VR shared a link to a research paper and a video from Sony Interactive Entertainment titled Evaluation of Machine Learning Techniques for Hand Pose Estimation on Handheld Device 
with proximity sensor. And this paper was accompanied by a video showing some of the work in action. As we can see in this video, each hand pose is being detected accurately without the need of any external sensors. And it's all being achieved with sensors built into the controller itself. It's very impressive when you see how the joints are moving and it provides a similar hand presence to what Valve can currently offer with the Valve Index. I really think this is very exciting and clearly work behind the scenes on the next generation PSVR controllers. And I believe that Sony could really pull something awesome out of the bag with the PS5 and the next generation PSVR. Next week, Sony are hosting a virtual event on both YouTube and Twitch, where they'll be showing off the games that will be launching with their new PS5 console later this year. As of yet, Sony have been quiet about their plans for the next generation PSVR headset, so hopefully this event will at least give us a glimpse of what we might be able to expect in the future, but I'm not gonna be holding my breath as I suspect the plans for PSVR 2 will come later down the road after the console launches. I'll be tuning into the event and if you wanna catch it live yourself, it will be held on Thursday the 4th of June at 1 p.m. US Pacific, 9 p.m. UK, and 10 p.m. in Europe. And before I wrap up this episode, I just wanna give an honorable mention to the Unreal Engine 5, which was unveiled this month by Epic Games with some footage of it running on the upcoming PS5. Now, VR developers predominantly use one of two game engines for their VR game development, Unreal or Unity. This new Unreal 5 engine supports VR and features a new lighting system called Lumen, which adds fully dynamic, realistic lighting to any scene without the need of baking it in during production. And also Nanite visualized micro polygon geometry, which allows developers to add incredible detail to their games. Now, although this tech is a great step forward for games in general, it's unlikely we'll see this in VR titles anytime soon as it's very performance intensive. So will likely only benefit PC players. And also VR developers won't be able to get their hands on this new engine for some time yet. But with that said, it's always interesting to see what we can expect moving forward with computer graphics, as this tech will likely pave the way for more realistic VR games and experiences in the future. And that concludes the State of VR for May 2020. If you have any feedback or clips that you feel should be featured on the next episode of State of VR, feel free to email me at contact at virtualrealityoasis.com. Leave a like if you like the video, make sure you're subscribed for all my future content, and as always, I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.